Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on whichever part of the globe you are in. Hearty welcome to today's session of NNF Next Learn from the Legends International Webinar Series. Today happened to be one of the days of a week where uh, the part of the world where I am from, India, we celebrate the National Newborn Week. And uh, it is apt that we have a session that is very relevant to one of the aspects of neonatal health, which is uh, not much talked about as we get fascinated by other uh, the uh, the more, uh, I, I must say, glamorous uh, aspects of neonatal intensive care, the neonatal nutrition and the micro aspects of neonatal nutrition. We say wisdom is the ability to apply one's knowledge and insight to navigate complex situations and challenges. Most of the time, what happens is when uh, we face a problem, we blame it on one factor, where, whereas the parameters that lead us to that situation are multifactorial, the multiple hit theory or whatever you want to call it. So without wasting any more time, I have the great pleasure to introduce the legend for the day, Professor Rakhavendra Rao from the University of Minnesota, USA. Uh, thank you, sir, for joining us. He would be enlightening us today on uh, the topic that I just mentioned, one of the topics in that series, what's new in iron supplementation neonates. To moderate today's session, I also have great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Jagdish Prasad Sahu, who is an additional professor in the Department of Neonatology at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Bhuvaneswar, India, and Dr. Priyambada who's a consultant pediatrician neonatologist at the Halia Women's and Children's Hospital, Palakkad, Kerala, India. So I would hand over the session now to both of them. I would request them to introduce the speaker and the topic. And then after that, uh, uh, let us hear from uh, Professor Rakhavendra Rao on this much awaited topic. What's new in iron supplementation in units? Over to you, Jagdish and Priya. Thank you so cool. much, sir. Yeah. Um, sir, so I will uh, introduce our eminent speaker today. Uh, so Dr. Raghavendra Rao is Professor of Pediatrics and Director of the Division of Neonatology at University of Minnesota in the USA. He's a graduate of Kasturiba uh, Medical College in Mangalore, India, uh, where he also completed his post-graduation in pediatrics. He completed his DM in neonatology as the, at the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research in Chandigarh before moving to the United States in 1994 for a fellowship in neonatal perinatal medicine at University of Minnesota. He joined the Department of Pediatrics as a faculty in 1998 and rose through the ranks and is correctly, currently a tenured professor and director of the Division of Neonatology. He ho also holds faculty appointments in the graduate program in neuroscience and uh, the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain. Dr. Rao is a member of NNF, IAP, Society of Pediatric Research, and a member and past president of the Midwest Society of Pediatric Research. He's a member of the Pregnancy and Neonatology Study Section of the NIH. Dr. Rao's research interest is brain energy metabolism and injury under adverse perinatal conditions, early detection using serum biomarkers, and novel neuroprotective strategies. Perinatal iron deficiency is an active area of research of Dr. Rao, and he has had uh, continuous funding from the NIH and other organizations for the research and has published over 140 peer-reviewed papers and book chapters. He has received awards for his academic work, including the Founders Award from the Midwest Society for Pediatric Research for his contributions to the development of academic pediatricians and children's health research. It's a great privilege to have you here today, sir. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. So, good evening, everyone. So as Dr. Piyambada was telling, so Professor Rao is a pioneer in the field of neonatology, particularly with special interest of 
perinatal iron deficiency and how it is affecting the developing brain. As we all know, the iron is deficient in premature babies and also this iron deficiency in the newborn babies is also related to the ultimate neurodevelopmental delay and cognitive outcome. So when I was going through the research of Professor Rao, so there are a lot of research uh, in the rare studies and how this iron metabolism is affecting the rare hippocampus, how it is affecting the cytokine oxygen systems. So we will all discuss with sir and we will try to find out some of the answers. So what should be the dose of the iron, when it should be started. So whether 4 milligram per kg is enough or 6 milligram per kg is enough. So we will discuss with sir about the new concepts in the iron supplements, its advantages and all. So now, without wasting much time, I request Professor Agavendra Rao, sir. We are all waiting to hear from you, sir. Sir, please, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good evening to all of you. And as Dr. Manoj said, it could also be good morning, like it is good morning here and maybe good afternoon in some other part of the world. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Manoj for inviting me to give this talk and as i was telling them earlier i do not consider myself a legend so but i have done some work and i'll be happy to share that um and again i also want to uh, apologize because i was supposed to do this talk in june but there was a last minute family uh, emergency that i had to cancel so i do apologize and again thank dr manoj uh, and all of you for understanding uh, and thank you, Dr. Priyamada and Dr. Sahu uh, for the introduction. Um, can you all hear me now or I just need maybe some thumbs up from Priyamada or somebody? Yes, we okay. can hear you well. Please go ahead. Okay. All right. So first of all, I just want to give some disclosure. Uh, as, as, as it was mentioned, I do have research funding from the National Institute of Health for my basic science work. And then I also had uh, funding from Sysmix America. This is a company that makes uh, um, hematology analyzers. Uh, neither of the organizations have any say in what I'm going to talk today. Uh, so it is uh, unrestricted funding. And I will also discuss a supplementation protocol that we use in our uh, unit that is not peer reviewed. And I will uh, mention that again when uh, we reach that point. So the overview of my talk today will be to briefly touch upon perinatal iron metabolism, what are the common causes of perinatal iron deficiency, and what are the current screening and supplementation recommendations from professional societies, and uh, finally ending with a biomarker-based individualized supplementation strategy, uh, whether we can achieve a better outcome using such a strategy. So iron and iron-containing enzymes are essential for tissue oxygen delivery and energy metabolism in all cells and organ systems in the body. And we are all aware of the common iron-containing proteins such as hemoglobin, myoglobin, and cytochromes. And there are over 200 enzymes that contain iron. In the central nervous system, iron and iron-containing enzymes are important for energy metabolism, myelin synthesis, synaptogenesis, and neurotransmission. And now there are more data showing that iron is also important for epigenetic regulation, which can have a transgenerational impact on the offspring. So there is, um, during the perinatal period, so there is a continuous supply of iron to the fetus from the mother throughout gestation. However, 80% of all the iron the fetal accrues occurs in the third trimester when it can range close to one to two milligrams per kilo per day. So this is important to know because premature babies born before in the, any time in the third trimester are going to miss out on this iron accretion. So what has been described and demonstrated very well is that the total iron body content in the third trimester is 75 milligrams per kilo. And this will be close to about 260 milligrams in a full-term infant weighing three and a half kilos. It will only be about 35 to 36 milligrams in a 500 gram preterm infant. Most of the iron is in the red blood cells as hemoglobin, 
and the remaining uh, ion, ion is split between ion containing protein as well as storage form primarily as ferritin. So the neonates can be at iron deficiency for two primary reasons. One is decreased iron delivery. So iron deficiency is the most common micronutrient deficiency worldwide. And pregnant women are particularly at risk. So maternal iron deficiency impacts 30 to 40 milligrams pregnancies worldwide. And the incidence could be also much higher in developing countries. Even in developed countries, uh, maternal iron deficiency is common, and especially in adolescent met mothers who themselves will have iron needs for their own growth and development. So in the United States, for about 16% of adolescent mothers have iron deficiency anemia. Uh, I mean, iron deficiency, and about 2% are I have iron deficiency anemia. Placental dysfunction, primarily due to maternal hypertension during gestation, can also have an impact on iron delivery. And maternal obesity, stress, and inflammation are known to impact fetal iron delivery, primarily through the hepcidin um, mechanism. So with the increasing obesity risk uh, in the United States, maternal obesity has become a primary reason for uh, risk of iron deficiency. And as Dr. Sahu was mentioning, preterm birth is a major problem because of the lack of time for iron accretion. One could also become iron deficient if there is uh, chronic hypoxia. So here the iron deficiency is primarily in the brain and other organs at the expense of uh, red blood cells. So maternal gestational diabetes intrauterine growth restriction and maternal smoking are some of the common causes where the fetus can develop tissue iron deficiency without developing anemia. So why does that happen? So there is this concept called the inter-organ prioritization of iron. And this has been described in a variety of animal models as well as in autopsy studies from human infants of diabetic mothers. When there is negative iron balance, the available iron is prioritized to the red cells over all other organs in a very systematic, organized way. So the first organs to lose the iron is the liver because that is the one that contains ferritin, the storage form of iron. And later, skeletal muscle, heart muscle uh, also will become iron deficient. And the final competition for the iron is between the developing brain and red cells with the brain losing out to the red cells. So the last organ to lose iron uh, is the brain. So the brain becomes iron deficient prior to the onset of anemia and is responsible for the neurological effects that Dr. Sahu was mentioning. And when you start the iron treatment, the repletion also occurs in the reverse order with the first organ to get corrected is the red cells over all the other organs. So this is important because the iron transport across the blood-brain barrier is developmentally regulated. And if the infant remains iron deficient for a long period of time, there is a risk of persistent brain iron deficiency that cannot be corrected. So looking at some of the data that show uh, that I have looked at the neurological effects of iron deficiency on the newborn brain, in the infants of uh, infants born mother with iron deficiency, a uh, study from Dr. Basu et al., as well as from Dr. Bora et al. from India has shown the hippocampus is smaller and there is also altered temperament at birth. Data show that infants of iron deficient mothers have poor motor development at six months and long term they have poor mental, psychomotor and behavioral deficits. Preterm infants with iron deficiency have abnormal neonatal refluxes. There is a series of elegant studies by Sanjeev Amin uh, showing that the conduction um, in the artery system is delayed, likely because of an impact on um, uh, myelination. The neonatal refluxes are also impacted uh, in the neonatal period in preterm pre infants who are iron deficient. And infants of diabetic mother who have brain iron deficiency have evidence of poor recognition memory at birth and psychomotor deficit lasting at least until one year. So it's important that we address the uh, iron deficiency early 
so that these long-term uh, impairments could be prevented. So let's look at some of the prevention and treatment strategies that have been in use. So maternal iron supplementation, it prevents maternal iron deficiency, and there are data showing that uh, such supplementation can delay uh, preterm delivery. So there are some studies again done by Dr. Bora in uh, Assam Medical College in Dibruger, showing that as the maternal hemoglobin increases, uh, even by a gram, there is going to be a three-day advantage in the delivery time. However, uh, indiscriminate supplementation of mothers is also probably not advised because in iron sufficient women, there is a risk of perinatal morbidities with iron supplementation in the form of uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension uh, as well as intrauterine growth restriction. So it is not to be taken lightly. Um, and then, obviously, there are many gestational conditions that are associated with IM, uh, perinatal iron deficiency, though so they are early detection and treatment, so maternal diabetes, maternal hypertension. Um, if, the, if they are detected early and treated, you will reduce the risk of perinatal iron deficiency. One of the important things one can do to improve the iron nutrition is delayed cord clamping or cord milking. Uh, and the two procedures are probably comparable. So this procedure will reduce the risk of iron deficiency up to one year in full-term infants. And MRI data show that such a strategy improves myelination in motor, visual, and sensory regions of the brain. And it also looks like uh, it improves fine motor and social function at four years, especially in boys. And some of these studies were done in develop, developed countries, showing that uh, it is something that is very universal. Now, you all probably know that cord milking uh, is contraindicated in preterm infants below 28 weeks of gestational age because of the higher risk of intraventricular hemorrhage. But there are now new data uh, that shows that cord milking is safe in uh, infants more than 28 weeks gestational age. The other thing one could do to improve or prevent iron deficiency will be to limit phlebotomy losses, which, which will be especially have a big impact in um, preterm infants. So the current recommendation for iron supplementation for full-term infants from the American Academy of Pediatrics is, is to promote exclusive breastfeeding for the first four to six months of life. And then those who are not getting um, uh, enough iron, again, those who are breast milk, so when their breast milk intake is more than 50%, uh, iron supplementation either through dietary means or through medicinal iron at one milligram per kilo per day, starting at four months. In addition, avoidance of cow milk because of its risk of inducing protein milk intolerance. And the use of iron fortified formula if breastfeeding is not possible are recommended. So the question is, is there a role for early iron supplementation for at-risk infants? So I just want to talk about a study that was again done by Dr. Bora's group in the Bruger uh, Assam, Assam Medical College, where the incidence of maternal anemia at delivery is almost universal, 90 to 100% of the pregnant women at delivery there are anemic. And neonatal iron deficiency defined as a serum ferritin less than 75 nanogram per ml is seen in 40%. So in this setting, full-term infants were randomized to iron or no iron starting at about 36 hours of age at a dose of one milligram per kilo per day and continued until six months. The outcome measures were hemoglobin, serum ferritin and motor development at six months and parental report of diarrheal and respiratory diseases. So this table shows the imp uh, impact of such uh, supplementation on hemoglobin and serum ferritin, as well as motor development in this group. Overall, babies that received iron supplementation in the neonatal period had higher hemoglobin, and this was seen in the whole cohort, as well as both the infants born to anemic mothers and non-anemic mothers which is a good thing because that says a universal iron supplementation is appropriate in their population. 
And I think what is equally important to see here is the infants that received iron supplementation had higher serum ferritin at six months compared with those who did not receive such supplementation. Again, this was seen in all babies born to all mothers as well as anemic and non-anemic mothers. So why is this important? Because there is active myelination that is still ongoing after the baby is born and most of the active myelination happens during the first one to two years of age. And availability of iron at that time will have a better uh, role in improving myelination, something that was that has been described with delayed cord clamping. And the things, two things worry about is one, is there an uh, improvement in the motor development with such treatment? So here, what, what they had looked at was the mean age in months achieved in motor development. So in other words, how many, what was the motor age of six month infants? So the infants that received iron supplementation had their motor score, which was much more closer to their chronological age compared with those that were unsupplemented. Un, um, and again, there was no increased parental report of diarrheal or respiratory diseases. So this is something that is um, that that tells you that one may have to modify the iron supplementation strategy based on their population. Um, you know, the, 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 whether such a strategy will result in long-term neurodevelopment has yet to be determined. Now, what about the preterm infants? So we know that they are at a higher risk of iron deficiency because of the variety of reasons. So the current recommendation, which currently is 13 years old from the American Academy of Pediatrics, recommends two milligrams per kilo per day of iron starting at one month and continuing until 12 months for those preterm infants that are receiving more than 50% of their nutrition through breast milk. If breastfeeding or breast milk use is not possible, then the recommendation is to use an IS implemented formula, which in the United States contains 12 milligrams per, kil per liter of iron. They do recommend an individualized approach by measuring serum ferritin at one and six months, but do not really say what to do with the data or how to adjust the do uh, uh, supplementation dose. The European Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition has similar recommendation, uh, but is slightly on the higher side. So two to three milligrams per kilo per day from two to six weeks until 12 months for infants with birth weight less than 1.8 kilos and one to two milligrams per kilo per day from six weeks to six months for those with two to two and a half kilo birth weight. And again, those infants with a birth weight less than kilo, the recommendation is to start iron supplementation even earlier at two to four weeks. So let's look at some of the um, evidence to support this. Dr. Saho specifically mentioned, is this iron supplementation dose enough or should we look into something higher or lower? So do preemies need iron supplementation? So we should start from there. And data clearly show that there is a risk of iron deficiency without iron supplementation with incidence as high as 25 to 85 percent for all the preterm infants. And even late preterm infants, 30 to 40 percent of them are iron deficient. Conversely, if you use iron supplementation for eight or more weeks, the risk of iron deficiency is lowered. Whether such a strategy has an impact on growth and neurodevelopment has not been well studied. However, there are some data showing that um, infants with two to two and a half kilo birth weight, if they were iron supplemented in the neonatal period, had less behavioral problems at three and a half and seven years of age. What about the timing of supplementation? So there are data showing that if you start supplementation from two weeks versus the four to eight weeks that is currently recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics, results in lower risk of iron deficiency and need for red blood cell transfusions, better iron storage at discharge, and possibly better neurodevelopment at five years, or at least no harm on neurodevelopment. However, there are some concerns as to is there a risk of iron toxicity because of excess iron absorption? Because the iron is regulated at the absorption level. And in, in, in babies, especially extremely low birth weight babies, the feeling is that their iron uh, absorption is not well regulated during the first one month of life. 
And secondly, because the iron is primarily needed for erythropoiesis at this age, there is better utilization if started after the onset of erythropoiesis. The question then is, what should be the recommended dose? So the typical dose used by um, most of the places and also recommended by the uh, professional societies is two to four milligrams per kilo per day. But if you look at all the literature, doses as high as 24 milligrams per kilo per day have been used. It looks like in the 1970s and 80s, it was not uncommon to use very high doses of iron. And those who are on two to four milligrams per kilo per day, they are at a risk of iron deficiency in about 32%. And those who receive an erythropoiesis stimulating agent, such as erythropoietin or dardipoietin, a dosage of three to 20 milligrams per kilo per day is recommended. And at least there are two studies that show that even with 12 milligrams per kilo per day of iron supplementation and meticulous, meticulous adjustment in dosage, 60 to 60 per, 66% of the extremely low gestational age neonates have evidence of iron deficiency as defined by a serum ferritin less than 75 in the neonatal period. So what about neurodevelopment? So this is a secondary analysis of the data from the peanut cohort. Uh, I'm pretty sure many of you are aware of the peanut trial. It was a randomized trial of high dose erythropoietin in extremely low gestational age neonates. The iron supplementation started at three milligrams per kilo per day when infants were on 60 ml per kilo per day of feeding and was increased to six milligrams per kilo per day when the feeding volume reached 100 ml per kilo per day. And dosage up to 12 milligrams per kilo per day was used based on serum ferritin or zinc protoporphyrin to heme ratio on day of life 14 and 42. So association between cumulative iron dose at 60 and 90 days and baby scale of infant development at two years were compared after adjusting for gestational age, research site, APCAR, IVH, necrotizing enterocolitis sepsis, and red blood cell volume. So what was seen here uh, is at both 60 and 90 days, both babies in the babies in the placebo group as well as in the EPO group received more iron. That is what is currently recommended. So the mean iron intake on day 60 was three and a half milligrams per kilo per day in the placebo group and close to five milligrams per kilo per day in the EPO group. And at 90 days, it was three to three and a half milligrams. So this resulted in a higher cumulative iron intake, especially in the EPO group, both at 60 days and 90 days. And conversely, there was less RBC volume transfusion in babies that received um, EPO compared with those that received placebo. Looking at the three Bailey scale of infant development scores, there was a positive correlation with the cumulative iron at 60 days and Bailey scale of infant development cognitive score, which was significant. Some trend for motor development, but not much of an improvement in language component. And this was seen in both the placebo group as well as the EPO group. And when you look at the effect size for every 50 milligrams per kilo of additional cumulative iron, there was a positive impact on cognitive component, which was, which was significant, um, but there was no difference in either the motor component or the language component. And then if you divided the data based on the placebo or EPO group, and then also control for the IV iron, the, 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 the relationship between cumulative iron at 60 days, as well as the cognitive development especially was very strong with the EPO group showing a greater improvement. Now, whether it is because they received EPO or because they received even more iron than the placebo group is not known. And this effect was seen only with the cumulative iron up to 60 days, but not at 90 days. However, one has to be a little bit cautious uh, instead of just giving into so, so the same data set, when then you break it up, as looking at what is the cumulative iron up to 36 postmenstrual age. So here on the left side, you see that graph with the four gestational age groups separated out, 24 weeks in red, 25 weeks, 26 weeks, and 27 weeks in green. You see a positive relationship on motor score. However, beyond 36 weeks, 
you actually see a negative correlation. So the more ion you give, less is the motor score. So this, this would caution against using uh, high doses of ion for long period of time. And why should we worry about high uh, doses of ion? Uh, because you know LGAN can regulate hepcidin and ion absorption. And studies have shown that with doses between nine to 12 milligrams, that is no evidence of oxidative stress in blood or urine and no changes in plasma antioxidant levels. So these were the acute effects that were looked at. And then again, long term, there is no higher risk of either BPD, ROP, IVH, neck, or sepsis. And even the peanut data set shows that there is no increase in BPD with higher cumulative ion. However, the, there are now data showing that with the doses more than six milligrams per kilo per day, there is a risk of intestinal dysbiosis with higher proteus and bifidobacterium and lower alpha diversity and higher predicted potential for bacterial epithelial in in invasion, although definitive necrotizing enterocolitis was not seen in this study. So some practical aspect, ferrous sulfate is a commonly used agent because it is cheap, well-tolerated, and effective. And about 30% of the uh, ferrous sulfate administered gets absorbed. Dosing once daily is as effective, as effective as three times a day dosing. Iron supplemented with breast milk is better absorbed. And high doses of iron supplementation can, ha can have an impact on absorption of other divalent metals such as calcium, zinc, uh, and manganese. And at least uh, in older infants, uh, there are no evidence that there are GI side effects with iron, iron supplementation. So in the last few minutes, I want to talk about a biomarker-based iron supplementation, whether that can achieve a better iron nutrition without impacting the side effect. The commonly used biomarkers uh, are serum ferritin, which is the storage form of iron. And there are data showing that cod ferritin less than 75 nanograms per ml is associated with slower artery conduction speed, likely reflecting abnormal myelination and abnormal neonatal reflexes in preterm infants, poor recognition memory at birth in infants of diabetic mothers, and especially with those who have a very low cord ferritin, less than 35 nanograms per ml, and poor mentor and psychomotor function at five years. There are at least two studies showing that impact. However, uh, the serum ferritin is not a very good predictor of neurodevelopmental abnormalities or even iron deficiency in the presence of inflammation. And now there are new data that just got published showing that it is not a good predictor of most natal iron deficiency, response to iron treatment or neurodevelopment in LGAN. So this is a study of uh, Darby Poetin that just got completed. So 650 infants were enrolled in the trial. It's a multi-center trial. And from that database, they, had, they were able to get uh, data on the iron, supp iron uh, supplementation from 100 infants. And what you see here is both at first 28 days and after 28 days, there is no correlation between reticulocyte hemoglobin, which is an indicator of hemoglobinization of the reticulocytes and serum ferritin. So lower reticulocyte hemoglobin indicates iron deficiency and lower ferritin should indicate iron deficiency. But what you see here is an inverse relationship that the ferritin level, instead of being lower at lower uh, reticulocyte hemoglobin, is higher, both in the first for 28 days and then after the 28 days. And again, if you look at the response to iron supplementation, what you see is cumulative iron administration correlates positively with reticulocyte hemoglobin. In, in other words, more iron you give, higher is the reticulocyte hemoglobin and more iron sufficiency in the first 27 days. But with the serum ferritin, there is a relationship, but it is in the opposite direction. So the more iron you give, lower is the serum ferritin. So it is uh, just not possible to use that as a marker of um, iron response. Another data that, that's from a smaller group of infants, about 18 infants, also showed that there is no correlation between percent iron absorbed versus the serum ferritin in stable preterm infants. 
whereas there is a positive correlation with either transferrin or a negative correlation with ion uh, transferrin saturation, telling that ferritin is not a good measure of effectiveness of ion treatment. And then finally, when you look at the serum ferritin and the neurodevelopment, there is no correlation between the serum ferritin in the NICU during the neonatal period and two-year daily scale of infant development for, uh, for any of the three um, uh, measures, even when you uh, control for inflammation. The other biomarker that is used is zinc rotoformin to heme ratio, which is an indicator of ion-limited erythropoiesis, where the ion is substituted with zinc in the protoporphyrin ring. So during ion deficiency, the zinc rotoporphyrin to heme ratio increases, and that happens before a decrease in hemoglobin. And if you are able to measure the zinc rotoporphyrin to heme ratio in immature uh, RBs, it's even more sensitive for ion deficiency. Unlike ferritin, zinc protoformin to heme ratio is not affected by inflammation, but is affected by RBC transfu uh, transfusion as well as erythropoietic uh, stimulating agent administration. Uh, there are data showing that a cord pH, a cord zinc protoformin heme ratio of greater than 118 micromoles per mole is associated with abnormal recognition memory at two months. And again, uh, the data show that the zinc protoformin to heme ratio does correlate with the Bailey scale of infant development at two years. Again, the data where the zinc protoformin to heme ratio due in, the, in the neonatal period, looking at the two-year outcome. And again, as you know, higher the ratio, greater the risk of ion deficiency. So you do see that the Bailey scale of infant development is lower in those that have higher zinc protoformin to heme ratio. And this effect is seen primarily for cognitive and motor score, but not for language score. The third uh, biomarker that is now getting used more and more is the reticulocyte hemoglobin. And this is an indicator of hemoglobinization in reticulocytes. And the advantage of reticulocyte hemoglobin is it is a component of complete blood count in some commonly used commercial uh, analyzers. In adults, reticulocyte hemoglobin correlates with bone marrow ion level. And again, it is not affected by inflammation. It can be falsely low in hemoglobinopathies, but that is one downside of uh, using reticulocyte hemoglobin. And there are data showing that a red HE of less than 29 picogram is indicator of ion deficiency in preterm infants with very good sensitivity and specificity. And we have done some studies in our animal models what we are seeing is the reticulocyte hemoglobin decreases before the onset of brain ion deficiency. And in non-human primate infants with postnatal, early postnatal ion deficiency, reticulocyte hemoglobin has comparable predictive accuracy as ion indices for both ion deficiency and anemia, and also for impending brain metabolic dysfunction. So a reticulocyte hemoglobin in this model of less than 30 at two weeks was the best predictor of future metabolic dysfunction in the brain. So the advantage uh, of, again, reticulocyte hemoglobin is it does not need additional blood volume, unlike the ion indices. There are other biomarkers which are looking specifically at brain health in ion deficiency, both in humans and animal models. So one of the things that has been some research is the cord blood exosomal vesicles. So the exosomal vesicles are uh, extruded from the parent cell and are available uh, and are present in the serum. So they carry the same molecules as the parent cell. So in human infants at risk for neonatal ion deficiency due to either maternal ion deficiency or obesity or diabetes, the extra exosomal vesicles contain low contact in two in moles in males and higher BDNF in females. Now, in our model of non-human primate model of infant ion deficiency, we have seen parallel decrease in uh, stachydrin and homostachydrin, which are metabolites of proline and betaine in both the serum and CSF. However, at this time, we do not have any uh, indication that either of these uh, compounds have any predictive accuracy for long-term neurodevelopment. 
So finally, I want to end by telling about the iron supplementation protocol that we follow in our NICU. And again, this is not peer reviewed. So what we do is for all babies with a birth weight less than 1800 grams, we get a baseline serum ferritin at 14 days or two weeks after the last transfusion. And if the serum ferritin is between 100 and 350, we start iron supplementation at a total dose of four milligrams per kilo per day. And if, if the infant is on darbipoietin, the dose is six milligrams per kilo per day. This is total dose, so the dose available in the diet plus iron supplementation. We hold supplementation in dose with serum ferritin more than 350. And then we monitor the serum ferritin every two weeks. And if it is less than 100, we increase the iron dose by two milligrams. If it is between 100 and 350, we continue the same dose. And if it is more than 350, we hold iron and recheck serum ferritin in one to two weeks. The overall goal here is not, not to get serum ferritin to normal level, but primarily to prevent further decrease. So the maximum dose we use is up to 12 milligrams per kilo per day, and we divide the dose when the dose is more than six milligrams. We also use zinc supplementation for growth in our unit, and we avoid simultaneous zinc and iron supplementation when the dose reaches six milligrams per kilo per day. We do not stop supplementation after a transfusion. And then, we will have sometimes a situation where the serum ferritin remains stubbornly below 40, even when we are on 12 milligrams per kilo per day of iron. So in those cases, we check a reticulocyte hemoglobin, and if that is more than 30, and if the hemoglobin is more than 12, we continue the same dose of iron because it's an indication that there is no iron deficiency either in the red cells and most likely not in the brain. If the reticulocyte hemoglobin is less than 30, but the hemoglobin is good, then we hold darbipoietin, continue the same dose of iron, and check serum ferritin in two weeks. If not on darbipoietin, then we continue iron in the same dose and check serum ferritin and reticulocyte hemoglobin in two weeks, and then make decision as to whether to continue or um, increase the dose. I'm oh, sorry, or... or um, or, or basically stop diabetes if the baby is on diabetes. And in cases where the radical hemoglobin is below 29 and hemoglobin is less than 10, most of these babies will need a red, red cell transfusion. Or in some cases, if the baby is overall stable, we check radical hemoglobin in one week. So at discharge, again, if the last serum ferritin is less than 40, we discharge them on six milligram per kilo per day of iron and monthly adjust based on the baby's weight. The dose is decreased to four milligrams at three months, and the, and the supplementation is continued for one year. If the serum ferritin is greater than 40, then we discharge on four milligrams per kilo per day and continue at this day, this dose for one year. We routinely don't check serum ferritin after discharge, but there are normative values available in the literature all the way till five years if someone wants to use that to for, for, for adjusting the dose. So to conclude, neurotoxin deficiency is common and has negative impact on neurodevelopment. Attention to maternal health and delayed cord clamping or milking is probably the best way to ensure perinatal uh, iron sufficiency. Preterm infants are at greater risk of iron deficiency and are likely to benefit from, benefit from iron supplementation. An individualized biomarker-based strategy is potentially superior to universal supplementation strategy. However, what is the ideal biomarker as well as the optimal dose, timing, and duration of supplementation have yet to be defined. Monitoring for iron deficiency post-discharge is also prudent because early when neonatal iron deficiency predisposes to postnatal iron deficiency. However, the ideal screening strategy has yet to be established. I would like to end by acknowledging uh, my mentors and collaborators both in uh, in the United States as well as uh, from Assam, Dr. Bora, my funding uh, and the facilities. And then I want to just thank all my alma maters that have, that have been responsible for who I am today. Thank you. So, uh, thank you so much, Sal. It was such a nice presentation.
So uh, now I'll just uh, go through the question and answer sessions. So Dr. Priyambada. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you so Can much for the session, idea. sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, so the first question, um, a recommendation in Jehovah's Witness preterm newborns. Parents opted for erythropoietin. They have high reticulocyte count but low iron despite intake of 8 mg per kg per day. So, is there any recommendation when we have a restriction? We have or used, or... Yeah, we have used up to 12 mg per kilo per day and I think what, uh, you know, what I would recommend is if you can do the serum ferritin and reticulocyte hemoglobin, that can definitely help you. Um, so if you are if you are already reaching the age, so you do have uh, capacity to go up up to twelve milligrams per kilo per day. Uh, just divide that that into six milligrams per kilo per day twice. Probably do it twice. But overall, if your uh, uh, reticulocyte hemoglobin is thirty or greater, that is usually a good indication that the iron, iron um, uh, dose is adequate. So serum ferritin in that case is not very uh, useful as a um, as an indicator. And then if, there's retic if the reticulocyte hemoglobin is less than 30 and if the serum ferritin is also low, then I think it is appropriate to hold off on giving um, uh, darbipoietin just to avoid uh, the, the 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 risk. Now I just want to uh, show, which is probably uh, we'll we'll get a little bit better answer. So there is this one. So there is actually this trial that is now uh, underway. It's called the DV trial, which is looking at IV iron. So it is an IV slow release iron supplementation for these babies because. Babies who are on darbipoietin, there are data showing, old data showing that sometimes they may need a small amount of IV iron in addition to what you are giving orally. So maybe one to one and a half milligrams per kilo. But this, this study is uh, still um, in, in the recruitment phase. Okay, sir. Uh, so the next question is, what is the normal range of ferritin levels? So I think Sarah has clearly shown yes, in the, uh, yeah, Sarah has already given. Uh, then Dr. Kanyamam is asking, in our study from PGI Chandigarh, we found iron store at bath was significantly lower in small for gestational age neonates, both term and preterm neonates. In India, we have high burden of term low birth weight babies. When we should start iron in these babies? And second question she is asking, as in India, our iron deficiency rate is very high. Recommendations are to continue prophylactic iron in all children till adolescence, starting at six months in torn babies. That is Anemia Mukt Bharat program. So what did you say on this? Sir. First of all, Kanya, nice to nice to have. I know Kanya from my PGA days a long time ago. I think the second second part I think was more of a comment. I and I appreciate that that uh, there is this kind of a program looking at long term iron, specifically for small for gestational age. Um, there are no data to show uh, wh whether to start iron supplementation early or not. Uh, because most of the studies will exclude those babies. But based on what was done in uh, Assam, uh, in that high-risk um, group, you know, would, recommend, would suggest that an early iron supplementation probably will be, probably will be appropriate um, as long as you are able to monitor the response. The other way may be that those infants may need more iron than the one milligram per kilo per day that the AAP is recommending for uh, breastfed babies. So that may be a group where a higher or a higher dose or an earlier response, uh, earlier supplementation may be beneficial. So maybe Dr. Uh, Kanya should do a trial. Uh, sir, also, ma'am, yeah, has another question. Uh, ELBW neonates receive many transfusions. How do you start and titrate iron dosage in these babies? 
So that's a very good question. So it is not unusual to see very, very high ferritin levels. So we do not start iron supplementation for babies who have a ferritin level more than 350 because of the because of two reasons. One is that I think whatever iron you give, you probably won't absorb because the hepcidin system is quite active. So you will not be getting um, any iron uh, coming into that. So there is a very small study which was pub which was not published was presented at one of the PAS meetings, showing that even infants ELBW infants with serum ferritin greater than thousand, even when you start them on two milligrams or four milligrams per kilo per day, by around nine months, a majority of them are iron deficient. So in other words, so the biggest change you will see in ferritin or for the iron need is when the baby starts growing. So the rapid growth rate is primarily responsible for depleting the iron stores. So I would say don't need to start until it is less than 350 and then start after that at the lower, do lower doses because they do have it, but you may want to adjust it. Now in our place, sometimes we see a situation where the ferritin is very high, the hemoglobin is low, and the baby is on a lot of respiratory support or at least some sort of support. So there, what sometimes we do will be to give one or two doses of erythropoietin. So that way, the idea is you are going to drive the erythropoiesis. So since you already have higher serum ferritin, it will get used up. Because a high ferritin, low hemoglobin usually indicates that the because of maybe there is some inflammation that the uh, that the red cells are not not utilizing. In other words, they have uh, iron deficiency at the red cell level, but they are not able to utilize it. So sometimes we give one or two doses of uh, we use darvipoietin because it is once a week dosing. So we use that to bring up the hemoglobin. Uh, but if the baby is really needing a lot of respiratory support, they will they will end up getting transfusion. But almost always the ferritin level will come down once the baby starts growing. So next question is from Dr. Madhu Palaman. So can we give iron supplements if the preterm is on IV antibiotics? Huh. So we, we, we continue to give uh, in our place. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question to know as to what happens when there is uh, an infection or anything. So again, in the peanut trial, they have uh, looked at culture positive sepsis uh, and then also culture negative sepsis as one of the outcomes. And they did not see an impact of iron supplementation on, uh, on, on either of those things. So we do not stop. But you know, sometimes what happens is babies who are needing IV antibiotics, say for example, because of the necrotizing enterocolitis, we may not be able to feed them. And we are not a place where we use IV iron. We, we used IV iron when we were on the peanut trial, but we, we, we typically don't. But now both the Darby Poetin trial, which is now concluded with 650 babies, as well as the two, uh, as well as the peanut trial. So IV iron was used. Um, in 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 those cases too, but in our case, we continue uh, continue supplementation as the baby is on feeds. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir uh, Manish Kumar sir has asked: Is there a way to find liver iron store in newborn? I think the liver serum ferritin and liver uh, ferritin they kind of correlate. So I think you can get a good idea of what the liver iron is by looking at the serum ferritin. Sir, the next question is from Dr. Bharat Srivastava. So how do you modify the iron supplementation if babies on transpyloric feeds? We continue to give it. I, I I get the point because I think Absolutely. you know what um, what I understand is um, because you know is iron going to get absorbed um, um, if it is given transpyloric? It will get absorbed. So we will continue using iron supplementation. But our most of our babies that are on transpyloric feeds are usually a little older. So that is when we think about starting. You know, either they have BPD or trach dependent. So by then the iron need starts to go down. 
but we still use it. Uh, so the next question is from uh, Dr. Manal. If the baby needs blood transfusion, is there an indication to stop iron supplementation at the time of blood transfusion? We do not stop. We do not stop feeding either. I mean, we actually, I should, I should, I stand corrected. There are, there are, there are uh, strict criteria that we use. We typically, uh, so the stopping the feeding during a transfusion, uh, we have an algorithm depending upon the baby's postnatal or the baby's postmenstrual age. Uh, so during the period and also the hemoglobin. So if the hemoglobin is very low and if the baby e is still at risk for neck, we do stop feeding during the transfusion um, and then usually for about six hours. So our feeding is usually every two or every three hours. So maybe two or three feedings will be missed. And at that time, we don't give anything. If that is the time the baby was supposed to get iron, baby will not get it. But after the transfusion is completed, then baby will get the missing medications. But beyond a certain gestational age or a higher hemoglobin, we don't stop feeding during transfusion. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Jhang Ji. Is it necessary to supplement folic acid together with iron? We do not because uh, we use multivitamins. So that is a very common thing that we have. Um, uh, but not always, sorry. Again, so, so, so the iron supplementation we do, we have two forms of iron supplementation. So most of the time we give ferrous sulfate, but then later nearing the discharge time, we change that into a multivitamin that has iron in it. But otherwise, no, during the ferrous sulfate time, we do not use uh, folic acid or vitamin E. There are some programs that use vitamin E. We don't use it. Uh, sir, uh, the next question is, uh, preterm iron level screening schedule. Is there any specific screening schedule for preterm iron levels? Uh, not specifically the iron levels, mostly because it needs a larger volume. So the only uh, levels that we follow are hemoglobin and ferritin and occasionally reticular set hemoglobin. We don't um, do serum iron or transferrin uh, saturation and all those. But there is a program that we have published um, in Journal of Pediatrics a few years ago. One of our uh, uh, collaborators, they monitor, they have a very strict iron supplementation that is based on transfer and saturation. And they adjust the dose based on the transfer and saturation, uh, always trying to keep it more than 20%. So. The, the next question is from Dr. Kimberly Ants. So, Sar is asking, are your iron doses based on supplementation only or is it adding together the nutrition plus supplementation? It is adding together the nutrition. Mm -hmm. So, we, you know, as um, you know, the breast milk has very low iron, but we do have, we use a human milk fortifier that gives 0.5 milligrams per kilo per day of iron when given at 160 milligrams. Uh, 160 ml per kilo per day. So the total iron, when I say 4 milligrams, it is 0.5 through nutrition, 3.5 through ferrous sulfate. So it is total dose. So the next question is from Dr. Deepa. As per present data, how long iron should be supplemented in preterm neonates? I think Sir had uh, addressed this in the slide. Uh, yeah, I mean, at least in the... Yeah, I think, you know, the, the recommendation is uh, from the American Academy of Pediatrics is up to one year, um, but the uh, European Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition uh, will depend upon the body weight. So if the body weight is less than 1.8, they go for one year, between two to two and a half, they go for six months. So next question is from Dr. Moni. Other than the serum ferritin level, can blood hemoglobin be a guide for iron supplementation? Uh, only when the hemoglobin levels are low, uh, it is going to be of use to say that you are at having iron deficiency. A normal or a higher hemoglobin does not rule out iron deficiency because you know there is a prioritization. So whatever iron is available will be will be used for maintaining the hemoglobin. Um, but, you know, I think 
uh, as I said, what I can see this with all the data that are accumulating over time, I think reticulocyte hemoglobin will be become the preferred biomarker because of the variety of advantages it has. Um, because the reticulocyte, reticulocytes are in circulation only for two days, and that is a good indicator of what's happening in the bone marrow. And many of the common, common commercial uh, analyzers uh, give uh, reticulocyte hemoglobin as a part of that. So you don't need additional blood, and it can do with just a capillary sample. Uh, and then again, I think that that I, I I see that may become kind of the preferred way to monitor down the road. Sir, one other uh, personal question, sir. Uh, sir, in place of uh, uh, reticulocyte hemoglobin, because most of the CBC counters don't give that, sir, can we only follow the reticulocyte count as a guide for the iron supplementation? You can, because I think that will give you an indication that um, the bone marrow is trying to produce more red cells, and that is the time then you need to make sure that you have enough iron. So if you use the reticulocyte, reticulocyte count, um, but then I think you also need a hemoglobin. You know, basically, what I'm telling is, if your reticulocyte count is very high and hemoglobin is very low, or at least lower, that means the iron that you are giving may not be sufficient. But if your reticulocyte um, count, you know, basically people have used that. It's one of the things, again, they think that the iron utilization is better when there is already an active erythropoiesis. Uh, so the next question is from Dr. Mamta. What is the ideal iron supplementation strat strategy in a term SGA baby? I think Kanya ma'am had also asked. Uh... Yeah, again, you know, I think... Uh, here, there is no, the American Academy of Pediatrics does not um, differentiate the um, small for gestational age babies. But if you go with the, either the European Society for Espagan recommendation or even the Canadian, so those are based on body weight or a birth weight. So maybe one could use that as the criteria for small for gestational age. You know, that is one thing. Uh, I was thinking about that. So in other words, I think the baby is less than 1.8. They will need 2 to 4. If they are between 2 and 2.5, and they need 1 to 2. So that may be the way to do it. So the next uh, question from Dr. Supreet. So he has actually complimented your talk. And she has got four questions. Is there any role of vitamin C supplementation with ferrous uh, sulfate to improve the viability of the iron? We don't use it. And I think, you know, again, giving iron with breast milk probably is something that has been looked at. You have better absorption with that. Um, vitamin C, That's at least in the neonatal period, I am not aware of. So any RCT support the role of biomarker versus age-based supplementation as recommended by AP and Espagat? Any? Uh, no. No, you know, there is actually, there is this trial that is, uh, somebody's like, microphone is on, I think, right? So, uh, so there is this trial, which is a small trial uh, that is enrolling here. Uh, looking at iron supplementation based on biomarker and then looking at um, neurodevelopmental outcome. Uh, so this is a small study that is just underway. So if you look at it here, the dose, you know, the standard dose is basically what somewhat the AAP recommends, even though it is a little higher, four. So the AAP recommendation is two. Uh, but then the high dose is basically what is a biomarker based. So this uh, data if they are able to complete and publish, will give you some guidance. And you can see here again, uh, Dr. Sahu, they are looking at reticulocyte count as one of the outcome measures. You are muted, I think, Dr. Yeah, Sahu. Yes, sir. I can't hear you. Yes, sir. Role of iron supplementation in hemolytic diseases. So in a hemolytic diseases, technically speaking, you don't need additional iron except maybe for a short time because all the iron that is produced during hemolysis will be stored as ferritin. So 
you know, that normally also happens in a baby that is born after birth, there is going to be a transient increase in ferritin level because there is going to be hemolysis. Because, you know, everybody knows the hemoglobin goes down, right? Physiological anemia of uh, maturity. So the same thing happens with hemolytic anemia also. And, you know, this may be one situation where in addition to iron, folic acid supplementation may be beneficial because sometimes you will see that the iron, um, the, the response is better, um, especially if you have dimorphic anemia. So, so for us, what happens is more, sorry, for us, sorry, what happens for us is most of the time the hemolytic disease, if we have it, you know, if the baby needs exchange transfusion or something, we usually then, you know, it's less of an issue, but otherwise uh, we just follow the same routine. Sorry, Priya Mada. Sorry, sir. Uh, so, so the next question is from Dr. Uh, Moni. Should iron supplementation always be started when babies get at least 50 to 80% of the oral feed? Yeah, I mean, uh, 60 ml per kilo per day is the minimum amount that was used for both the peanut trial. Um, and that's what we also use. So our protocol typically says, and we, 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 we kind of wait almost like two weeks by the time we start iron supplementation. So our protocol will be that we check, we start the Darby poetin after one week, and then we start the uh, iron supplementation at two weeks. By then, most of our babies will be on at least 60 ml, if not more, of feeding. So, so regarding the preparation of iron, which iron preparation is best for the neonates? Dr. Nalnikanta is asking. I don't think there have been any head-to-head -head comparison based on that. Uh, as I said, most of the people, at least in our place, we use ferrous sulfate. But I know there is data showing um, ferrous gluconate. Also, people have used, um, I don't know of data in the neonatal period that has compared different formulations. There are some data, I think, in older children and infants. So I'm sorry, I'm not able to answer that question. The next question is from Dr. Mamta. Uh, how early can we start prophylactic iron in term AGA babies uh, whose mothers have been anemic? I my my the only uh, one, the only study. I mean, the, there are some studies that have been done uh, by Dr. Ziegler that shows um, that in a situation like this, how quickly the ferritin. Uh, in other words, how how quickly these infants can become iron deficient. So the only one that I know of is a study by Dr. Vita Bora from Assam, where the iron supplementation was started at 36 hours after birth um, because of the very high incidence of iron deficiency anemia in their population. Uh, and that was well tolerated. Um, and there was no, they did not do a, a like a detailed micro, bio, microbiome assessment, at least in that study. I think it was a separate study that was done but at least uh, there was no increase in pathogenic bacteria uh, in the infant's stool with that treatment. And there was no adverse effect on neurodevelopment, maybe some improvement in motor development. So that is the only study that uh, I'm aware of for AGA babies uh, starting early, early supplementation. Uh, another question is from Dr. Supriti. Is oral erythropoietin is available? Oral erythropoietin has not has been has been shown not to be effective. You know, I think there's a very good question because you do have erythropoietin receptors in the small intestine. So there are studies done by uh, Dr. Pam Kling from Wisconsin, but uh, Dr. Sunny Jewell has shown that oral erythropoietin is not effective in getting erythropoiesis. Uh, so next uh, question from Dr. Supreet uh, Kurana. Any adverse effects of uh, erythropoietin on, on ROP and NEC? Interesting question. Uh, in the in there have been, as you know, there have been uh, two high dose erythropoietin trials. So the peanut trial where they gave thousand units uh, for every other day for six doses, and then four hundred units Monday, Wednesday, Friday for until 30, um, 34 weeks, I think. And then other studies, a Swiss EPO trial, where they gave much higher doses, but very early. I think they gave like 1,000 units per kilo 
three doses in the first 72 hours or something like that. Neither of those studies showed any, and, and sorry, the third study that has now been completed, but has not been, um, the primary outcome has not been published, just the safety profile has been presented is the Darby Poitin trial with 615 pens. So in none of these three studies, there was an increase in either ROP or, um, or, or neck. And, um, you know, even though the first two studies, both the peanut and the Swiss repo studies were negative studies, I think they did show certain important things such as the risk of adverse outcomes is higher if the babies needed transfusion and erythropoietin resulted in decreased transfusion. But there are more data. I have a colleague who is looking at this um, in the context of uh, iron deficiency and ROP uh, in the same cohort to know. Uh, but the simple answer is no, there is no increased risk. The I do understand as to where that question is. I, I do understand where the question comes from because there, is a, there are retrospective data uh, that have tied up erythropoietin use with the ROP but these prospective studies have not shown that connection. So the next question is from Dr. Moni. What is the best monitoring biomarker you feel? I think a reticular set hemoglobin probably is the one. If I have a choice, I think that is what I will use. Other thing again is the zinc protopore minor to him ratio for the same reason that it is quite um, quite sensitive. You know, again, that is kind of the last stage before anemia. So basically, you need a biomarker that is going to pick you just before the infant become anemic. So that is when you know that the brain is already at risk. So zinc protoferent heme ratio probably will be equally good. Uh, but again, it is not something that everybody can do it in all the places. So in a peanut trial, there were some centers that adjusted the dose of uh, um I think I have a slide here. So you can change, you can use the ion supplementation based on the zinc protopore fire into heme ratio as well. Uh, so, so the next question is from Dr. Subair Bhatt. Uh, with the recent study on non-utility of ferritin as a marker for supplementation, are you changing your unit protocol? I think we have to because, you know, you cannot show all this data and then stick with the same thing. But, you know, change is difficult because, <laughs> but I think this uh, uh, reticulous and hemoglobin uh, in, in our monkey study that we just, that just got accepted clearly shows it's also a good indicator of impend brain dysfunction. Uh, but again, based on this 2023 paper from um, Dr. Barr, based on that, I think there will be a push towards going for, but again, as Dr. Sahu said, not all the places are able to do the reticular hemoglobin, but in our place, I think we may we probably will change. Uh, next, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Sukham Jain, who is Professor of Neonatology at Government Medical College, Chandigarh, uh, she wanted to share one study what she has conducted one ICMR trial under publication. They have trial on iron in late preterm and torm SGA and the neurodevelopment outcome at two years. So the results what she has seen is ferritin, total iron binding capacity, serum iron and hemoglobin, all four increased at six months. And there was effect on second generation neuron myelination and the BSID score in cognitive domain. Uh, both were normal in the groups, but somewhat it is more in the iron group. So this is the study what she wants to share and this is under publications. So next question is from Dr. Um, Anita Yadav. Yes, sir. Sir, you want to say something, sir? please. I just want to congratulate uh, for doing that study. <laughs> I think it is studies like that are important. So next is from Dr. Anita Yadav. What about the post intrauterine transfusion babies with isoimmunization? They have got high serum ferritin and continuing to need PRVC transfusions. Should we use ESA for them? ESA I, as I said, I think... Yeah, I, I think the need for transfusion in these babies, I think to a, to a large extent will depend upon their overall status. You know, if they are continue to be anemic, if they continue to be in, continue to need a lot of respiratory support, for example, you know, then we end up transfusing them because that is transfusion is used for those situations. 
But in other cases, as I was telling for the, even the preterm infants that have received multiple transfusions, giving one or two doses of erythropoietin uh, is, is fine. And again, this is based on some very limited data from Japan where they have done this. And this is almost similar to what we see with, uh, uh, with people with chronic renal, disease, renal failure. Because the people with chronic renal failure also tend to have low hemoglobin and high ferritin levels. And they also will benefit from getting erythropoietin, primarily because they don't have erythropoietin because of the renal failure. So it is similar to that situation. Except that, unfortunately, you know, there are no randomized trials that have been done um, to do that. I think that that is the one negative thing. Another question from Dr. Anita. Should we monitor hypo HA and micro MCV rather than or along with serum ferritin as a marker for iron deficiency? Yeah, just for the other people to know what it is. So this is again some of the uh, hemo heme analyzers uh, will give you information in addition to reticulocyte hemoglobin reticulocytes or something called as uh, you know my, uh, micro hemoglobin and other things. The problem, at least in the United States, is those values are currently considered research values or research um, results. So we cannot use those for clinical practice at this time. But there is at least one publication, uh, maybe that's what she's referring to, by Tim Barr in General of, in general of Pediatrics, showing that it is quite effective as a marker of iron deficiency, microhemoglobin. So Dr. Bharat is asking, uh, why do you stop gene supplementation when giving higher, higher iron doses? So the way the iron gets absorbed at the gastrointestinal tract, there are basically two receptors. One is the transferrin receptor through which iron, which iron gets absorbed. And the other one is what is known as a divalent metal transporter or DMT1. So the divalent metal transporter transports all the divalents. So there are 10 divalents and zinc, calcium, manganese, and even lead, unfortunately, they are all transported by the DMT1 in the intestines. So if you are not separating out the zinc or the calcium with iron, then the absorption of those elements will be impaired. But this is one of the reasons why there is a higher risk of lead toxicity in uh, people with iron deficiency because their uh, DMT uh, receptor expression is upregulated. And at that stage, if they are exposed to lead, you know, one of the common things of exposure to lead by children is lead containing paints. You know, they, they, and especially when someone is anemic, they tend to have pica, they tend to eat paint chips. And that can actually make them. And the same thing can happen. Iron deficiency, people iron deficiency are also at higher risk of manganese toxicity. So manganese is another divalent uh, metal that can also get absorbed. So next question. Yes. How often should we check the hemoglobin levels in the low birth weight babies when not on oxygen support? I, that is a fantastic question because I think one of the best things we can do will be to limit phlebotomy losses because you know for every uh, gram of hemoglobin, you are losing 6.5 milligrams of iron. And just checking the hemoglobin, so we deliberately, uh, you know, it's very difficult to kick the practice. So in our hospital, we check the hemoglobin once a week, typically, uh, for all these low birth weight babies. But then... Um, those who are very stable, we uh, sometimes get them very less frequently, maybe every two, three weeks. Um, just because after birth, there is going to be a drop in hemoglobin, the physiological uh, enemy of prematurity. But we don't want to be in a situation where the hemoglobin level is very low without our knowledge. So I think limiting the checking, if the hemoglobin is very good, especially after like a delayed cord clamping, if they are starting with a hemoglobin of 17, 18 sometimes, then we don't check them at all. As long as they are in room air and doing well. Uh, so the next question is from uh, Dr. Rachida. Do you adjust the dose of post-discharged iron supplementation for the type of feeding? That is iron fortified formula versus breast milk. 
Yes, we do. In fact, I think in our, our iron, uh, the babies who are on iron uh, fortified formula quite often don't need additional iron because the iron content of the discharge formulas in our place has 12 milligrams per kilo. I mean, again, it depends upon the serum ferritin before we discharge them. And what we are calculated is our discharge formulas will give about two and a half milligrams per kilo per day for a baby receiving 160 ml per kilo per day of formula. So depending upon the serum ferritin, we may give two milligrams per kilo of additional iron, or if it is very low, then we give more. But we do adjust it. But in our place, about 70 plus percent of babies are discharged home on uh, mom's milk, on uh, on breast milk. So the next question is from Dr. Perraju. How strong is the evidence for the use of erythropoietic stimulants for reducing the need of blood transfusions and prevention of anemia? I think the data for reducing the need for transfusion uh, is quite clear. Uh, both the peanut trial, uh, like I showed you the data, that the volume was much less in those babies who got the EPO. Uh, the Darby Poetin trial that is concluded has also shown. Um, so I think the primary reason is one has to know. So, so the blood transfusion in the NICU, I think, is probably not very evidence-based at this moment because we are using transfusion for a variety of reasons you know depending upon the baby's um, illness status baby whether baby needs transfusion where baby needs pressors and so on and so forth and that makes it difficult to know why the baby got a transfusion uh, so sometimes that can have an impact but otherwise, I think that is primarily the reason. So there are two reasons why we are using still darbipoidin, even though the peanut trial and the Swiss EPO trial were negative trials, primarily to reduce um, the need for transfusion. And second, you know, there are some small trials of about 100 infants showing that babies that got darbipoidin had less cerebral palsy and better neurodevelopment. And there is also some suggestion that uh, erythropoietin may help in uh, babies with BPD. Um, so for all these reasons, we are still using it. We are using darbipoietin because it's once a week versus EPO, which is three times a week. But not all babies. We only give that to babies below uh, 1,800 grams. So the next question is from Dr. Jaya. What are the recommendations for iron supplements post bowel resection, particularly terminal ileal resection, and also in neonates having stomas, especially ileostomies? Yeah, we don't modify our iron dose, knowing very well that some of it may not get absorbed. But we are much more, our surgeons are much more aggressive in uh, refeeding the succus entericus. So basically, when babies do have ostomy, once they are more stable, they do pass, they do put a red rubber catheter into the mucus fistula so that we collect whatever is coming in the proximal ostomy and then feed it into the distal mucus fistula. So our nurses are very good in refeeding. So we do not change the supplementation uh, based on either of those conditions. So, uh, sir, Dr. Mubasir has congratulated for the excellent presentation to you. And uh, he has asked any research hypothesis or question for future studies on this topic. <laughs> thank you. First of all, thank you for your kind uh, comments. Appreciate that. Um, yes, I think the field is going, uh, it all depends upon, as I said, there are these trials uh, that are ongoing looking at IVIN versus uh, oral IN for the extremely low birth weight babies. Uh, there are trials even, I think, conducted in India. One of my uh, senior partners, Dr. Michael Georgiev, is involved looking at IVIN to pregnant women. Uh, so that is uh, another uh, trial that is going on. And then in our animal work, we are now looking at other ways to improve um, the brain function because, you know, as I said, the brain iron concentration cannot be corrected after a certain time because the blood-brain barrier is no longer um, sensitive. So using other met other things um, as an adjunct, so for example, uh, choline supplementation, 
uh, in uh, iron deficiency as an adjunct therapy seems to be having a beneficial effect. So there are some trials that are being done um, of choline supplementation. So there are uh -huh. two, three questions regarding the say, preparations. Polydial versus fumarate, which is a better biofilm form of iron? And again, uh, whether iron sulfate is a good preparation of iron? Yeah, you know, that again, mm -hmm. as I said, unfortunately, I don't have data to show, but I think, you know, it's important to know that there are some suggestions that iron sulfate probably is not the best formulation to use. Um, but, you know, that is what is used not only in our iron supplementation dose, but also in our formula. Our formulas also contain iron sulfate, primarily because it is cheap and there is a wide availability. Um, but again, I not looked into, so I must I, I, I must admit that I not looked into comparative efficacy of variety of um, iron supplementation. And I'll make a note. So the next presentation, I will include that. Uh, sir, I think the next question from Dr. Supreet Kurana has been answered. Any oral erythropoietin available and its effect on ROB and NEC? Yeah. I think that's been addressed. Uh, so the next question from Dr. Jaya. How to add retic HB as an invest hemoglobin as an investigation in routine labs? What are the prerequisites? It all depends. I think the there are, I, as far as what I know, there are three commercially available um, analyzers that can give, give you the reticulocyte hemoglobin values, um, you know, depending upon um, whatever is available. I think it will be given as a component of the complete blood count. So whenever you get your complete blood count, you can always get it. Um, so for example, I know that in uh, Assam Medical College, uh, they were able to get the reticulocyte hemoglobin as a part of the CBC. So they must be having that analyzer there. Uh, next question is from Dr. Sukham, ma'am. Has anyone checked the accuracy of non-invasive hemoglobin estimation with the serum hemoglobin, particularly in extremely low birth weight and very low birth weight to screen for the anemia? Not that I am aware of. I don't know. The only time we are looking at, uh, I, I'm, I'm just want to clarify, is she thinking about plasma-free hemoglobin or I don't know whether that is what she is looking at. If it is plasma-free hemoglobin, the only time we do, we, we have a capacity to measure that. We only do that on our babies on ECMO, uh, mostly as an indicator of hemolysis. But I am not aware of any studies where it has been done as a measure. So there are some data, I don't know that I have it here. There is, in addition to that, um, there is some uh, biomarker work being done on hepcidin. Uh, you can do that both with serum and urinary urine C, urine uh, and that that can be used as an indicator of iron deficiency uh, but I, I don't know of uh, plasma three hemoglobin so the next question from dr nikita also yes we've answered role of stopping iron supplementation as suspected uh, nec uh, so the next question is from Dr. Supreet Kurana. Recommendation regarding the dose and duration of uh, darbipoietin in uh, neonates who are less than 1,800 grams. Yeah, we use a dose of 100, uh, oh, sorry, 10 micrograms per kilo uh, dose once a week. And again, we started on one week after birth and we continue until 34 weeks. But we do stop it earlier if it looks like the hemoglobin is greater than 12. And we are having problem maintaining um, serum ferritin. So then we are like, you're probably simply driving the hemoglobin and it's unnecessarily and creating problem. And other other situation where we stop sometime will be if there is um, pretty extensive clotting. Even though PINA trial or the CC portal did not show any association between um, EPO and um, clotting. Uh, like thrombosis. Uh, in adults, there has been some association with uh, EPO and uh, thrombosis. So if the baby has like a transverse sinus thrombosis or several deep vein thrombosis, then we stop Darby. So the last question, Dr. Jaya, 
uh, she has again uh, regarding the same uh, what is the recommendation for erythropoietin administration in neonates sara has already i think described so i'm not seeing any question in the question answer section and chat box now so dr priyamata do you think any questions are left I don't oh, think sir. So. I think, yeah. yeah. So that was just an excellent presentation, sir. So now I request yes. Dr. Nelby George to give that. Thank you, sir. From the side, uh, from, th thank you, Dr. Jagdish. I would like, from the NNF India as well as NNF Kerala and the organizers who learned from the legends, I would like to thank Dr. Professor Raghavendra Rao for his excellent talk and also sharing his wisdom and knowledge. Sir, it's always a pleasure to hear from legends. Thank you, sir. Mm. And also, Dr. Jagadish, my good friend. Thank you, Dr. Jagadish and Dr. Premvada for taking this in a nice way, with this presentation and this thing. And above all, I thank all the people who is attending this from all over the world. Thank you from NNF Kerala. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much for the opportunity, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. It was a pleasure listening yeah. to you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank Thank you, sir. Sir. Namaskar, sir. Namaskar. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We'll close. Bye-bye.